Hello folks and welcome back to English 306. In this lecture we'll be covering one of my favorite topics, uh, transmedia storytelling. It's uh, truly fascinating and it really blows your mind when you think about the, uh, the full implications of what this means, uh, not just for creative people who might want to, uh, you know, tell stories and not just stick to one medium but explore all, all of the possibilities, uh, but also just as somebody who enjoys uh, franchises like The Matrix, <laughs> one of my favorite movies, or uh, trilogies actually. Uh, and you know if you're a fan of that like me, that it's not enough just to, re, uh, just to watch the movies. You know, you have to get the comics, the games, uh, even the toys to some extent are part of the story. Uh, so as a, you know, if anybody with any uh, shred of creativity, I think, uh, really enjoys thinking about this topic and you know, what it means. This is probably only going to get bigger and bigger uh, in the future, but maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I know you've hopefully read the uh, the article at this point, so you probably already have a pretty good idea, at least, of what we're talking about here with, with transmedia. But uh, let's dig a little bit deeper, uh, because really this is a, uh, a good perspective to take when you want to analyze an artifact of pop culture, uh, something that is, um, let's see, how do, I, how do I say this? So if it's not limited to one thing, like it's not just a novel or it's not just one movie, uh, but maybe you're interested in some kind of, a, for lack of a better word, franchise uh, that you'd like to explore. Uh, we'll get into uh, many examples of that. Uh, but this perspective here, the transmedia perspective, gives you some vocabulary some language, some theories to work with uh, so that you can analyze that uh, franchise. And, you know, a lot of people enjoy doing this as their, uh, at least for one of their rhetorical analysis essays. So uh, let's dive a little deeper in though. All right, a little, let's dive a little deeper into the topic. So what is transmedia? Uh, they break it down quite nicely for you in this article, Jenkins, and he's got books on this, by the way. There's lots of other books and articles you can read about transmedia, so it's not hard to find additional sources. But here's the basic technical language for this. So you'd want to have you do want, you'd want to have this definition somewhere in your essay if you choose to use this perspective. So transmedia storytelling represents a process where integral elements of a fiction are dispersed uh, systematically. Uh, that's the first key, so it's not willy-nilly or random, but, you know, there's been some thought put into how to disperse it. The second one is really the key across multiple delivery channels. So it could be a story that you want to tell and you want some, some of that story to be in the form of a novel, but you might also want to explore other aspects of that story in the form of a video game. That's one that I'm familiar with. So you might want to take the take the player to places in that video game uh, that really haven't been explored all that well in the novels. Uh, for example, there's a game about Middle Earth, uh, The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. Actually, several games that are set in that universe, but uh, the game actually explores parts of this world that Tolkien created. Uh, you can walk around and do quests and there's new uh, stories there that you can't find just by reading the novels. Okay, so it's it's systematic. It's been dispersed across multiple delivery channels uh, for the purpose of creating a unified and coordinated entertainment experience. And this, this part is also key. Uh, so the idea isn't that the novels have nothing to do with the, the game, let's say, or the, uh, that the... Uh, the I like to use the toys as well. So let's say there's a line of toys out there uh, that really have nothing to do with the uh, the story. Uh, they don't really help you to explore the story in any way. We would say that's not really transmedia. Uh, maybe that's just some licensing, but it really doesn't have anything to do with this overall uh, experience, right? Be quite different uh, if the well. Let's just say there is a let's say there's a soundtrack to a movie. And there's a song or two on the soundtrack that have a story, you know, with the lyrics. The lyrics maybe you're telling part of the story of a character, let's say, or a character arc that's not explored in the movie. 
Okay, you see what I'm saying there? So it's like you listen, you watch the movie, then you listen to the soundtrack, and they sort of complement each other. Uh, so you're actually getting, you're sort of expanding your narrative experience through that soundtrack. So we would say that's a unified and coordinated part. It wasn't like the soundtrack just came along and had nothing to do with it. And just as, uh, before we jump into the, the, to the prompt, I'll just say this is, you know, one of the ways I come at this topic is from the video game world because again I am somebody who's talked to many many game developers and what they uh, one of the situations that comes up again and again has to do with games that are based on movies uh, so there'll be a movie one that always stands out to me is the, the Terminator movies so you might have seen the Terminator I think it's Terminator 3 you might have gone to see that in the theater and maybe played the game but I talked to some of the folks who had worked on the Terminator 3 game. You know, and I also talked to some of the folks that made the first Ghostbusters game. <laughs> so there's been quite a few of these. But there's been a shift now that transmedia has appeared. So what the problem was before with Ghostbusters, for example, that I think that movie came out maybe in like 1984. Uh, so the Ghostbusters movie came out, and while they were working on the movie, another one's E.T., kind of a famous game but but anyway uh they just went to these game developers and said hey make a game based on ghostbusters and they didn't even know what ghostbusters was about nobody had told them anything about ghostbusters they just like make a game on the about this <laughs> movie <laughs> and i think all they had to work with was like a picture of the, the of the car in ghostbusters and you know that obviously had something to do with ghosts uh, so they created this game where, you know, part of the game you're driving the car around and you're like sucking up ghosts with some kind of vacuum cleaner mounted to the car. Really, <laughs> it makes, makes like zero sense because uh, that's just not part of the movie. Uh, but they didn't have, again, this totally disconnected, these working on this game, have nothing to do with the movie studio. Uh, so it was uh, kind of crappy. Um, but, you know, as transmedia got to be more of a thing... Uh, especially in light of the uh, the Matrix, you know, the, uh, the Wachowskis, uh, they really didn't want to do this with this uh, Enter the Matrix game. So instead of just saying, hey, you guys make a go make a game based on the Matrix, and we're not even going to tell you what the Matrix is, <laughs> instead of that <laughs> uh, crappy approach, uh, they actually worked, the crew, they worked, the same people worked on the movie were working on the game, and they were trying to make sure that this, this game was part of this overall uh, experience, not just doing its own thing with no connection uh, uh, to the movie, to the Matrix. Uh, so hopefully that explains that a little bit more in depth. Uh, so just thinking about this, what are some of your favorite transmedia narratives? What's, you know, maybe you haven't really uh, dived into this yet, but there's, there's probably at least one that you've been involved in to some extent. Uh, the classic ones that get referenced a lot are the the Blair Witch Project. Uh, there was a lot of uh, stuff going on with the web uh, that kind of played into the uh, the movie. They kind of made it seem like this was really going on. and that It was almost like this conspiracy that you could uh, get involved in to like, try to solve uh, the mystery. And so there's a little bit of a, what you might call an alternative reality game uh, around this movie uh, that made it kind of cool. Uh, but, you know, another example, more common example is uh, Star Wars. I mean, think about how massive that franchise is. And I put Star Trek into the same category. I mean, you, yeah, there's lots of movies to watch. The movies are kind of the main uh, thing there, but there's also games like uh, Knights of the Old Republic, if you've ever played that great, brilliant game, uh, that really tells part of the story of Star Wars, not in a movie format, but in a game format. But it's not like the game is just based on a movie. You know, there's lots of games that are just basically retelling what happens in a movie. Uh, that's not what Knights of the Old Republic does. It's, it's actually a new story uh, set in that universe. And same thing with Pokemon. And so just take a few minutes. Think about some of your transmedia narratives that you enjoy and just list those for me. Okay, let's move on then to some of the advantages of this, why you might want to do it. Uh, some of these are just economical, financial, basically. This is the big one, sharing the common license. So it's really hard, for example, for a new game studio to come out 
and say, uh, here's this brand new thing, this brand new world, these, these characters nobody's ever heard of. Uh, it doesn't get any excitement, there's no buzz. It's, it's really hard to get the PR moving on something like that. Uh, on the other hand, if you say, look, this is set on, uh, you know, the, the Predator, <laughs> or Alien, <laughs> in the movie Alien, uh, then instantly you have this, this pop of people that are like, ooh, okay, well, I'll check out that game. Uh, one that I enjoyed recent, fairly recently was the a Mad Max game on the Xbox. And it was, you know, based on that uh, Fury Road movie. It's a good, good example of transmedia, but, you know, just the fact that it was connected to, you know, everybody was excited about the new Mad Max movie. There's a lot of buzz, a lot of uh, hype around it, so it made sense to make a game uh, set in that same uh, world. It did pretty well for uh, both sides, right? Uh, so that's a pretty obvious advantage. Another advantage is keeping that franchise alive in between the films. You know, you don't want to come out with a movie every few months, right? That doesn't, I don't even know if that's possible. <laughs> it, take, you know, it, take, it takes at least a year or more uh, to make a film, then make the sequel, sometimes two or three years. Uh, it's really nice to have something for people to do in between those. And it says novels there. And one of the interesting things about novels is, again, it, it takes a while for somebody to sit down and write a novel, you know, maybe at least a year, right? I mean... You look at somebody like George R. R. Martin, you know, I guess it takes decades <laughs> uh, for him to write the next uh, the next leg of that uh, story. So what has been happening, thanks to uh, the e-readers and Kindle services where they don't have to publish the printed book anymore, it's actually economical for the authors to write what's called a novelette in between the novels. Uh, so you see this with the Expanse series. It's a really popular uh, television series on, I guess it's on Amazon now, but there's it started as a novel. And they would write the novel, again, every you know year or two, however long it took them to write the, the novels. But what they started doing was in between those, they'd have a, what did I say, novel, novelette before I meant novella. <laughs> so, uh, they would write no, novellas or sort of mini novels basically really long short stories uh, in between the big novels. And those novel novellas would cover characters that didn't get a lot of uh, treatment, you know, in the main story. Might give you a different perspective, see what's going on with a different character. But it was a way, it was something they could churn out relatively quickly. You know, 100 pages, boom. You know, it's a lot faster to do that than it, than it takes to write one of these 500-page novels. But it's just something they can do in between uh, to keep the franchise alive, keep people talking about it, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty cool for everybody, right? Because if you're really a, if you're a big fan of uh, the Expanse, you want to read all those novellas too. Uh, but if you just want to stick to that main novel series, that's fine. You know, it's not like you uh, have to read the novellas uh, to follow uh, the main series. So it's kind of like a, you know, like I guess the same principle is at work with something like these uh, webisodes. You might get with a show like The Office. Uh, three, creating different points of entry. Uh, what this means is that people that, for example, uh, with The Walking Dead, that started as a comic book series. So people that love comics, they're always in the comic book stores. That's what happened to me. I just went into a comic book store, and it had been a while since I'd been in the comics, so I just asked the, uh, the, uh, the clerk there, Hey, what's uh, what's good? What what would you recommend? And he said, try out this, you know, Walking Dead comic. And, you know, that was way before there was a TV series. Um, you know, it just happened to be there, and I was like, okay, that looks pretty cool. I'll, I'll try that, and I ended up getting hooked on on the comic book series. But you know, what if I was somebody that didn't like comics? I wouldn't be in that comic book store. Uh, <clears throat> I still would have no idea what that was about. However, when the TV show came on, again, that's a different audience, a different market. Uh, people that would never set foot in a comic book store might watch the series, right? I think it's on AMC. Uh, so that's a different point of entry for people. And then somebody that really gets into the TV series might decide, hey, maybe I should check out the comics too. Uh, or maybe I should check out the game. You know, again, that Telltale uh, Walking Dead game, very popular with people that may not even like the show or read the comic, but they like the game. So it's a different way, it's a different hook uh, to get those folks involved. 
uh, for telling a story that's simply too big for just one platform. You know, you can't really, there's only so much you can do with movies, right? Even if you're uh, Peter Jackson, you know, you're making these like three hour long movies, you know, you, you, are you going to have a 30 hour long <laughs> movie? <laughs> it's just not really practical. Uh, but also, again, it's when you can do like a novella, you maybe cover one character, maybe that character's not important enough or interesting enough to warrant like a, a whole movie or a whole novel. But, you know, the novella's fine, unless you expand that story a little bit uh, without requiring too much of an investment. Uh, five, turning the audience into collective intelligence participants. Again, I guess uh, you can, there's so many ways you can invite the audience in to you know, maybe write part of the story. There's a big community around game modding. Uh, so a game comes out and sometimes they'll release what they call modding tools. I used to call them construction kits. But it was uh, an easy way for somebody who's not a programmer uh, to take some of those assets that were built for a game and make their own quest, maybe, or make their own level uh, for something like a Doom or a Quake-style uh, game. Uh, if it's a television show, though, this might result in people uh, building online forums and like discussing what's going on with the show, making predictions. If you ever watched the Survivor show, this was really popular. People would watch Survivor and then they would get online and talk to their friends and try to predict like what, what's happening, what's going to happen next week. Are there like little clues embedded in there somewhere? Uh, so people had a lot of fun, uh, you know, exploring those those theories. It was part of the of the thrill. Let's see. Uh, six greater sense of realism. You know, again, if you've got all these different media taking place, uh, you can really, I think, yeah, make it seem more realistic. I'm thinking specifically there about the augmented reality elements to it, and some of the ways you can uh, feel like you're connected to a transmedia franchise in a way that, that's not really there for the, uh, the the other media. You know, a lot of people I know that love the Pokemon Go uh, video game, for example, I, I think there's aspects of that that it kind of blurs the line in some ways between a video game and, uh, you know, the real world. I and mean, you're kind of out there in the, in the world exploring things. It's kind of some interesting, not to jump ahead too far, but synergies <laughs> between that social space and the game. Uh, itself. Uh, world building. Uh, so what this, this is a concept that's a little different than a traditional approach to writing a short story or a novel where you might sit down and think, okay, what's my plot? Who are the characters? Uh, you know, what, what's going to happen over the course of the, of the novel? Uh, here, instead of starting with that, you're, you start by thinking about the world that you want everything to take place in. And the sort of poster child for this, the real pioneer is uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who, of course, created this Middle Earth world. And he was just, you might even say, kind of obsessive about this, what, what he was doing with, with Middle Earth. I mean, he, he wasn't just saying, oh, look, here's some mountains. <laughs> you know, here's, some, here's where the orcs are. I mean, he's like writing, creating uh, cultures and languages and encyclopedias and dictionaries and just really fleshing out all of the details of, uh, of uh, Middle Earth. I mean, the, yeah, the map is part of it, but it's a lot more than just the uh, geography. I mean, really had like a backstories galore, uh, you know, lore that just went on and on and on. And this is, a, you know, he sort of set the tone for this. But a lot of other creators have followed this model. Uh, there's a game called The Elder Scrolls. It's uh, Bethesda. And they have a version of that called The Elder Scrolls Online. And again, I got to meet the guy and, and talk to uh, the lore master uh, for The Elder Scrolls Online component. And he was just, if you, if you watch that uh, match hat I did with him, he, he verifies this. He's like, yes, we're doing exactly what Tolkien did here. I'm creating languages for the various uh, races, uh, these fictional uh, cultures in the in that game series. We're creating backstories and all the stuff that may not be tied directly into the game itself, but it provides that greater sense of realism. You don't feel like, you know, if you see those old Western 
movies or you go to a play and there's just like a front like the front of a store or front of a barn but there's it's really just a piece of wood painted wood there's nothing behind it <laughs> uh, so that's what world building tries to uh, avoid so you don't want to just have this facade but you want everything to feel like it's real like there's some history here uh, you, you can learn more about you know just looking here at this map there's a uh, uh, cond <laughs> You know, I could learn about Khan somewhere, and there's there's probably a lot of uh, material I could read that would sort of flesh out what that place is. It's not just a random name somebody came up with, but there's actually uh, content there. It makes it seem a lot more realistic. Of course, the Elder Scrolls, you know, you can actually go to all those places on the map and, and check it out. Uh, so synergy is another one of these uh, buzzwords that you'll come across again and again, but Really, the idea of a synergy is this: everything's working together. It's kind of the sum of the, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, it is the model here. So instead of just being its own thing with no connection, uh, all of the different components to the transmedia work together uh, to make that experience more, uh, more immersive, not to mention more lucrative. <laughs> okay, so let's... Uh, let you have a turn at this. So I want, I'm just going to show uh, some of the different delivery channels that are available and just think about, you know, if you're creating a world, if you're interested in creating this kind of fiction or maybe just uh, experiencing it, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each delivery channel? So there's things you could do with a film, you know, again, thinking about things like, well, a film is typically two hours long, uh, but films typically have a high budget. So they're usually in a theater is where they make most of their money anyway. Uh, you have a big special effects budget, you know, everybody's watching it together, shared experience. So I'm kind of giving away some, <laughs> some of my thoughts. But of course, you could also think about the weaknesses of that movie uh, compared to something like a novel uh, or a game. So anyway, I'll be quiet because I want point here is I want you to think about this, not just listen to my thoughts on it. Okay, so novels and text. So what can you do? What are the strengths of writing a novel? As far as narrative is concerned, what could you do with a book or a story uh, that's unique to that medium? And also, what's what's some of the disadvantages compared to the a film or a game? Okay, so now let's move on to comics and graphic novels. And I know some of you probably are big fans of comics. Some of you might have never read one ever. So you might have to think a little bit more about what this has to offer. But, uh, again, think about some of the advantages of a comic. You know, again, it's probably cheaper than a movie. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> uh, and yet it has some, uh, some pretty unique advantages. So, again, think about that one for a little bit. Uh, and then the video. So I'll just, I'll just put video here, but... If you want to talk about films, that's fine. If you want to talk about a TV show, uh, that's fine. But just something that has a primarily a video format. Okay, now on to games. Um, so the big one here, obviously, is it's interactive. But well, what does that really mean? You know, in terms of somebody who just wants to tell a story, who wants to introduce you to some characters and, and the game world they created... Uh, what are the advantages of this medium? And then lastly, uh, this is one that was just sort of in its budding stages, I guess, when they wrote this article. Uh, but the mobile space, uh, the social space. You know, I always, uh, they're talking about Harry Potter here, but the one I always think about is the Pokemon Go. Uh, it really, there seems to be something pretty cool I think we're just starting to tap into the possibilities of this one you know when you can have something on your phone and you're carrying it around and you've got like it's connecting to the real world the augmented reality somehow so I don't know I think this one has a lot of room to grow but I want to again hear your thoughts on it just as a story storytelling or world building medium what are the advantages Okay, so then uh, to wrap up, uh, they talk a little bit about the the fan fiction. I always think about game modding, same sort of deal, but it's it's instead of just sort of being passive and consuming the media, 
uh, instead of just reading Harry Potter or watching Harry Potter, a lot of people, and it's not just kids, you know, it's plenty of adults as well, they, they want to write their own stories, you know, with Harry Potter and sort of explore different parts of the novel, maybe think about like what-if scenarios. And, uh, people have a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people do this with Star Wars too, but I mean, just about any franchise these days is going to have a fanfic. That's what they call it, a uh, fanfic community. Uh, one of my favorite shows is uh, Supernatural. That's about these two brothers, and there's, there's quite a bit of fan fiction out there of <laughs> varying quality. <laughs> uh, but some of it's quite good. And, uh, you know, of course, Twilight is mentioned here, and I believe there's, if I have this right, there's a series that started this fan fiction of that. What was it called? Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, I think. And that sort of took off and became popular in its own right. And there's lots of games that started off that way uh, as well. If you ever played the uh, Half-Life game, you know, somebody modded that and it became a Counter-Strike. And it started off just as some people having some fun making their own little, uh, you know, fanfic, basically. Uh, and then it took off and became its own thing. So it's, it's pretty cool. And, of course, there are copyright issues with a lot of it, and sometimes that sort of slows it down and challenges it. Uh, but again, there's whole books you can read about this topic if it interests you. Of course, some popular themes with that, uh, you know, you can't really do a crossover with the main, uh, you know, if you're the publisher because you get sued, right? If you have, you know, Batman in the same movie with Spider-Man, uh-oh, you know, you can't do that. That's Marvel and you know, DC and you get in all these issues or... <laughs> But just as a fan, you know, you, why not? You know, if you want to have Batman and Spider-Man run on a, do an adventure together, uh, that's fine. Uh, that's just what they mean by crossovers. Uh, romance, you know, a lot of times, especially in action series, there's not a lot of uh, romance. So, you know, maybe some of the fans want to know, like, well, what? Let's just create some, uh, some of our own stories, you know, with some romantic overtones. Uh, the Mary Sue is a term... That gets applied to some of the fanfic. Uh, what happens, I guess, a lot of the, you know, a lot of folks when they do fanfic, they put themselves or like a thinly disguised version of themselves into the story, and they make the that character like super duper popular, super smart, super powerful. They're like uh, just, uh, you know, impressing the heck out of everybody, and it's it's kind of frowned upon by, you know, more savvy readers. They'll just say, oh, that's just a Mary Sue story. You know, you got this, uh, one of the examples of this is uh, the character Wesley Crusher in Star Trek The Next Generation. And people actually accuse Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, uh, as being, uh, as, as creating this Mary Sue. It's like this, this character of Wesley was like everything Gene Roddenberry himself wished he could be like. You know, this, this sort of young kid who's like just so genius and he's just instantly solving all of these problems that all of these, uh, you know, professional engineers can't solve and, like, everybody likes <laughs> Wesley. <laughs> uh, so they kind of changed up the character gradually to make him a little bit more uh, likable. But that's just what they mean by that. Mary Sue. You know, I would, I would argue there's a couple of Mary Sues that have been introduced in the Supernatural series over the years. Uh, some people really love them. Uh, I just, I find it, <laughs> you know, same thing with Star Wars. Uh, I really don't like it when you have these sort of characters that pop out of nowhere with no training and no experience. And like, next thing you know, they're like kicking everybody's butt. <laughs> just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a Mary Sue, in, in my opinion. Uh, all right, so let's wrap up with a writing activity. Uh, so, you know, think of you know, about 150 words on this, you know, maybe a small paragraph. But I want you to think about something that you could develop conceivably into a transmedia narrative. Uh, so just something that ha it hasn't been done already. So not just say Star Wars, Star Trek. It's been done. You know, you try to think of something that's unexpected uh, that nevertheless could make for some interesting transmedia. I've got Down Abbey here. Obviously, that's it's a little bit of a transmedia narrative because it's got a show and a movie. I don't know if there are novels yet. I'm pretty sure there's not a video game about it. I could be wrong, but you know, it's it's up for you to decide. 
or Hamilton or Rival. Just a couple of examples off the top of my head. But you know, you know, put some thought into this. Think about maybe a game that hasn't been uh, well. You know, The Witcher. I guess that started off. I don't know if it's. I'm pretty sure it started off as as a novel, then became a game. Now it's a a TV show. So I guess that one's been done. But maybe there's another game similar or not that you think might work well for that. And so anyway, once you pick something, think about how you would do... A, let's just say you're like the big uh, manager and you can control all of these different things. So if there's going to be a comic book, what are you going to do in the comic that you're not going to do in the show or the movie? Or if there's going to be a game, what are you going to do there that's not in the in the film, etc.? So you don't necessarily have to do every single one of the medium every uh, single one of those media that we talked about. Uh, but, you know, at least pick two, you know, maybe three, and talk about, you know, how you could leverage all that to create that synergy <laughs> of transmedia. So, you know, just, just have some fun with it. You know, try to get uh, creative with this. And, uh, you know, limit it to about 150 words. Okay, so that will do it uh, for this lecture. Hope you enjoyed this. I think it's a fun topic. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please share those with me, and I'll see you next time.